Uh, I'm just going to put the presentation up. Right. OK. OK, brilliant. So there's a Slido link in there as well in the presentation so if you need it. So what we're going to do today is we're just going to work through a number of sections around some of the changes that have been uh, um, uh, announced in December uh, and what this is going to mean for planning in 2024 for local authorities. Um, so the way we're going to do this, we're going to do this through three sections. We're going to look at uh, three sections. We're going to have one section looking at local plans. We're going to do another section looking at decision making around planning applications. Another section looking at planning in planning and the environment. And then a fourth section at the end where we're just going to talk about the peer role that we, we have because we work very closely with our council of peers on a number of areas of work. And it felt like a grand opportunity to sort of talk about it. So in which case, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Rachel, just to talk you through a bit of an update around local plans. It's good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting us along today. It's great to see you all. Uh, my name is Rachel Ferry Jones, and I'm a principal consultant at the Planning Advisory Service PAS. And over the last few years, part of my work has been around supporting councils um, with plan making. And uh, so we thought it'd be helpful to give you uh, an update on what's happening on, on plan making and local plans. I think the first thing to say is as councillors, you know that you play an absolute cr crucial role in local governance. Um, and you can... Someone mute themselves. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and it's critical that you understand your local plan and it's critical because Understanding your local plan will make sure that the right decisions are being made to ensure that the development of your area um, and, and the impact on your community aligns with your long term corporate goals. And really, the local plan is your spatial interpretation of what those corporate objectives might be. So I'm going to cover sort of recent and important developments, um, particularly at a national level in terms of legislation guidance. Also looking a little bit about at the work that we do as PAS to support councils in plan making. What we've learned from that work that we're then able to share with other councils um, and officers and also what's coming over the hill, what's on the horizon. Can I have the next slide, please, Steve. So there's been, before we talk about the National Planning Policy Framework, I think it's worth referencing that there's been an awful lot of consultation, updates to policy, updates to guidance, things coming over the hill, and it can be quite confusing. It's confusing for me, and I work on it five days a week, just in terms of um, how did Simon Ricketts reference it in a recent blog? It's a treasure hunt, a treasure hunt to actually understand when something's being implemented, how it's being implemented, and indeed if it's being implemented. And I think there's a lot in the planning world. We learn things through verbal interpretations. And if you're at any point unsure, well, is this actually happening yet or is it something government are consulting on? Do ask your officers because um, I think it's a really confusing time with, with all of these different things happening. So moving to the National Planning Policy Framework, which of course sets the policies within which local plans in your council must be in conformity with. We, December 2022, we saw a consultation. December 2023, we saw a revised publication of the, um, I'll shorten it to MPPF. What's really key in the, the revised published uh, MPPF is that government remain absolutely committed to the priority of a plan led system and that updating your local plans, having an up to date local plan is is key and they encourage councils to continue to prepare and maintain an up to date local plan. They also, uh, you might remember in the consultation, there was discussion about how you set your housing need figure. And there's a standard methodology and government starting point has been in recent years that we all use as councils, that standard method to calculate your housing need. All councils across the country use that same method. The MPPF has clarified that that's an advisory. It's a starting point. And it does make reference to there being potentially exceptional circumstances where you might 
be able to use a different formula to look at your need. But it only gives one example, and that example is if your potentially demographics are different, because, for example, you might be an island with no land bridge with a, a particularly elderly high proportion of residents. That's the only example we've got. We do know of one authority that uh, only one authority that did manage to change that method, and that's because they were a development corporation and the level of data that they needed was so small that it didn't actually fit in with the standard method. But perhaps more importantly is understanding that's your need. You start with your need of what your forecast future. What goes into your plan is your housing requirement. And that figure might change when you start to look at constraints in your area. Constraints, for example, could be your Brighton, you've got the sea and you've got nowhere else to build. So that understanding that you start with the need, but what goes into your plan is the requirement, what you plan to deliver over the 15 year period can be different numbers. And sometimes that can be confused. The MPPF also has some incentives uh, to support councils getting plans in place. And importantly, for a, if you've got a plan that's five years, like recently adopted five years or younger, there's no longer a requirement for you to update on an annual basis your five year housing land supply. And for councils who are quite progressed in the current plan making, uh, for example, might be at submission uh, to examination, there's also arrangements that you may only have to demonstrate a four year housing land supply. So there are, are incentives um, brought forward in the MPPF. And next slide, Steve, please. Back one. Thanks. Um, staying on the MPPF, uh, one that you'll probably, many of you will be interested in is the green belt. In the consultation version, it talked about um, you shouldn't there wouldn't be a requirement to re to uh, re review your green belt boundaries where it's if it was to meet the housing need. It's the only option to meet housing need. The current version of the MPPF states that there's no requirement. It doesn't link it to housing need anymore, but it said there's no requirement for councils to review their green belt boundaries, but they may choose to. So there's still that they may choose to in exceptional circumstances. So that wording's just been tightened up a bit. In terms of the 20 most populous cities in the country and the 35% housing uplift on their housing need figure, that's gone from guidance into the MPPF. So shows a firm commitment from government. And I think if any, you may have seen the consultations this week from the Secretary of State about further reinforcing that in, in considering consultation on further changes to policy about, uh, you know, presumption in favour of brownfield land development. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely one that's staying, staying on the agenda. In the consultation version, there was suggested changes to the soundness test. They're the tests that a local plan goes through um, through examination and one of them they were going to remove was that a plan uh, must have a justified and appropriate strategy they've kept that in it's not removed so that's really important to remember that's still a test and there are various transition arrangements for how the new MPPF applies to you to councils wherever they are in the plan making process um, and, and that might be different for different councils, so it's important to keep to keep an eye on that. Next slide, please, Steve. So in terms of what's happening on local plans at government level, well, we can see that there is um, more of an appetite at government level for intervention. There are seven councils that the Secretary of State has directed to review their local development scheme, their timetables for producing a local plan. Um, and there are a further four that government have intervened to stop um, councils withdrawing their local plan. So there's definitely movement there in that we might see more intervention. 
government are also keen for all local authorities to review, given the MPPF changes to policy, to have a look at your local plan and consider, does it need updating? Does it need reviewing in light of those policies? And they would like all councils to, to send an updated uh, timetable for their plan making to them uh, in the spring this year. Also looking at updating local plans, a really important date. We're kind of between two systems. We know a new planning system's coming in the horizon. For those who are plan making um, at the moment, if you're, you're plan making in the current system, your plan has to be submitted for examination by the end of June 2025. And that's a really important date and government you know are keen to see councils who are able encourage them to submit their plans by that date duty to cooperate is really interesting there's been a lot of when i talked about verbalization of planning matters a lot of discussion about oh well, the duty to cooperate has been removed it's true that the leveling up and regeneration act does remove that but that's not come alive yet, it's not enacted. So the duty to cooperate is still relevant, um, still appropriate. In any event, even when that is enacted through the, the Level Up Regeneration Act, there will still be a requirement, probably through policy, for you to collaborate and work with neighbours. So we're likely to see an alternative that's just not placed in legislation, but will still be really important. Next slide, please, Steve. So in terms of what we do as PAS, well, we do a lot of work um, over the years working one to one with councils. We work with them, uh, officers on project management and resourcing, looking at the evidence based sort of support a local plan and helping to be that critical friend in duty to cooperate process and discussions. We also do a lot of templating and prototyping, helping councils to officers to streamline processes and more conformity and, and help speed up processes. And of course, as you know, we do a lot of peer to peer learning between officers and councillors. Uh, we hold networks, we hold a lot of events, training modules and our website's full of useful tools and case studies. Next slide, Steve, please. But what have we learned in all this work that we're doing with councils um, and on plan making? We've learned a lot of lessons, uh, what councils do well and what's more challenging, and we share them uh, amongst other uh, council areas. So what's important to get right in plan making? Number one is project management. Um, often with resources the way they are and that officers can struggle with project management. Um, are timelines realistic? have you got the right resources in place? What areas are you looking at? So we do a lot of work and we've learned that, you know, that that is so important in keeping a plan on time. But it's also important in understanding and where you guys all, all are so important is the decision making process and the governance. You've got to have a really tight governance that everybody understands and plan making is a long process. And you need to make sure at every periodic, you know, the right people, the right councillors are looking at it, that you're trying to make sure that, you know, there's not going to be any unknowns down the line that completely derail your plan. Understanding are there boards, are there scrutiny committees, um, what officer and senior leadership arrangements are in place to get the decisions that we need. Are there things that can be delegated to officers to, to move things along? Consultation and engagement, really, really tricky issue for lots and lots of councils. Um, we know that statutory consultees have also got their own resource issues, um, their own timetabling of the way they work. So how do we make that better through good engagement plans, stakeholder mapping, perhaps trying to use any conversations you have with statutory consultees to discuss multiple matters than one thing at a time. Evidence. We're all really, really risk averse, understandably, because of the challenges that can be faced at examination on a local plan. But it's trying to actually help understand what evidence do we really need to support our local plan? What needs updating? Um, and what's a proportionate update to things that we already have uh, in, in our hands within the council? And leadership. You'll understand more than anyone. You know, sometimes political cycles can be quite short. 
you might have a change in senior leadership teams and plan making process is a continual process and it can take a long time. So ensuring that senior leadership teams have that buy in early on, that you help them to understand that it, that plan making is a long process and that there are periods where you can affect change and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to start right from the beginning again. So really onboarding um, as early on as possible and making sure that that plan is for the communities. There's inevitably tensions um, between different aspirations, but it, it's finding a way, way to work with that. And my last slide, please, Steve. So what's uh, coming on the horizon? I've mentioned that we're expecting a reformed planning system, which will be a lot about the process. Some of that set out in the Leveling Up and Regeneration Act, but we're expecting more detailed regulations in the autumn of this year. Probably most importantly is governments uh, push for us to, to work faster, more streamline, more, more intelligently on getting a plan in place um, in a 30 month period. The Leveling Up and Regeneration Act, some of it alive, some of it not. We're expecting further consultation on national development management policies, which are policies which sit in local plans at the moment, but are pretty consistent across the country. So it's looking at what can you actually have at a national level that doesn't need repeating at a local level. Street votes consultation, that's about developing street vote orders with residents on a street um, to effectively grant planning permission for certain works. The infrastructure levy, another area I work on, uh, we've seen one consultation. I think we'll see another consultation on how that might work before we see regulations. And something I'm sure you're all interested in, climate change net zero. How can a lo local plan help with that? I think the first thing to say is local plan's not the answer. The answer is going to be a multiplicity of, of interventions and policy and regulations, but it is it is a something that can help with this uh, issue. And government in the MPPF have added a paragraph on added weight on energy efficiency, adaptation of buildings in decision making. And there are some innovative authorities out there who are looking at what how a local plan can support it. I guess the only thing I'd say with planning is inevitably that balance of ask. What are we expecting development to bring forward? How can it, you know, deliver everything? What what are our priorities? And as councillors, that can be really tough decisions for you as well. What are our competing policy priorities? How are we going to reconcile this? And what what are we going to expect from development coming forward? And finally, the next government. Oh, okay. um, who point. knows whether whether new planning uh, measures that affect local plans will come in? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm, I can see lots of questions coming in on Slido regarding uh, uh, elements of plan making, which we'll kind of come back to at the end. Uh, next, I'm just asking my colleague uh, Liz to just talk you through the, the, the sort of development management side of things uh, and the changes there. So, Liz, over to you. Thanks, Steve, and hello to to all of you councillors. Um, good to be here. Um, I am I work at PAS and I'm involved in development management. Uh, and very much like um, Rachel, I'm going to run through what TM is. I'm just going to pass over that quickly because I know that a lot of you um, are involved in development management and planning committee. What we're doing at the moment, what we're learning, and what's on the horizon. So um, next slide. OK, so most of you will know this already, but um, development management is um, is the name for the planning application service. So it's the kind of delivery end. It's the opposite end of, of the spectrum to policy making. It's the delivery end and it's it's delivering your policies on the ground through decision making on individual planning applications. It's important that your uh, planning um, application service or development management service is efficient to provide a good customer service to residents, but also that the outcomes of um, your DM service are, are positive and good and developments in the right place. It delivers you investments in your area, regeneration and creates better places. So that's that's what um, DM aims to do. Um, and local planning authorities and planning committees have a key role uh, in making um, decisions, uh, particularly on major 
and controversial planning applications. So they've got a, quit, a critical role, um, and, but it's a quasi-judicial role, so slightly different to other um, committees um, in that it's non-political um, and the role uh, you have as a ward councillor is very different to the role you have as someone who sits on planning committee which I'm sure you're aware of and don't forget also planning enforcement which is also part of development management and what that does is it makes sure makes sure that development is implemented as it's been permitted um, and it can be a real bugbear for a lot of authorities. Um, next slide. So there have been some things happening over the last year that I was going to um, draw your attention to, and um, I don't think I need to draw to to say this to you that but locally planning is a really big issue. It's a very high profile and visible issue, particularly in terms of decision making in your councils. So it's probably in your local papers um, every time planning committee comes up you've got items about applications that have been decided or what's gone wrong nationally the picture is probably um, I mean there have been press releases this week haven't there from the government but it, it, it does largely revolve around housing and housing delivery and how planning can do better in helping to deliver more housing which is much needed in the country um, so there's a lot of interest at the moment and a lot of change in planning um, as Rachel has pointed out Another trend that has happened probably over a number of years has been an increase in permitted development and permitted development um, means that you don't need planning permission um, to carry out certain work, certain development works. So um, and that's normally I mean, some of the things you might have seen are office to residential. That's been in the news a lot. Other areas are adding stories to existing buildings that can be done under permitted development. Instead of express planning permission, these larger things are dealt with through something called prior approval, where a set of tests are applied, but the council isn't allowed to apply their policies. So that's becoming that relaxation of planning rules is becoming a bigger pattern. Um, fees have been increased. I think it's the first time in about four or five years or longer. They're set nationally. This has been long heralded and the purpose of it is to fund better fund planning application services for the next bullet point, really, because there are significant and identified challenges around recruitment and retention of planning staff, particularly um, in the area of, you know, where, where you have experienced specialists and experienced planners, it's getting harder and harder for councils to to recruit and retain. Another area for DM um, that's been happening for a while now is that it's becoming more complicated as more legislation unrolls, whether it's to do with uh, sustainability, fire safety, um, uh, the environment, the Environment Act and biodiversity net game. It's getting more complex, which means you may need more skills as officers to deal with it and more training as councillors to receive applications that 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 have those matters in them. And also we're hearing that performance is going to change and I'll be talking about that a bit later. But the performance rules, um, I, I suppose, um, development management and planning application performance, it's been um, it's been highly um, checked and measured and tested against performance rules. Um, and I, I will talk about them very briefly, but it's it's something that, uh, that the government looks at very closely. So next slide. Um, so that I suppose that that neatly moves on to areas where councils are struggling with with achieving the uh, government set performance targets. Quickly run through. You probably know these off by heart, don't you? So so in terms of quality as a, as a local planning authority, you're expected um, that no more than 10 percent of major or non major applications are, are determined uh, are not overturned at appeal. So that's the test and you get caught on majors. That's that's the one that normal councils normally get caught on in terms of speed. On non-majors, you're expected to get 70% of applications determined in time. 
and that's 60 percent for majors. Um, but what you are allowed to do is there's a mechanism called extensions of time, which allows you to um, negotiate. The purpose is to allow you to negotiate and get better schemes as part of the planning application process. But they are, um, you know, I think councils will acknowledge this, they are used quite significantly to try and to, to meet the performance targets. So in terms of where we are at the moment, um, the government has strongly signalled that it's taking a tougher line on um, councils that aren't meeting those targets. So um, a signal of that, that was, that was signalled by a designation of um, two further councils in terms of the quality of decisions on majors. So the, the number, the proportion of overturns. And of course, a lot of major applications, they're virtually all determined at planning committee. So it's a key area there is around how, how a planning committee is determining applications. So. From 2022, we had one designated council. We now have three. Um, in terms of councils at risk, the numbers have gone up as well. So we've got 17 councils in the danger zone for speed um, and an additional 12 that are in the danger zone around quality on major applications. OK, so moving to the next slide. So what are we doing about it? At PASS. So we have an important role in supporting councils and hopefully uh, helping them avoid uh, kind of getting their designation and supporting them. So in terms of designated councils, um, we have an important role. We almost have a bespoke role in supporting them. Um, and of course, there's a knock on effect for us if if more councils are designated. We do need to provide more support to those councils. So we help them adapt and change and improve. Um, we we offer a lot of training as well, uh, not just to officers, but to councillors um, and we provide planning committee training for councillors as well. Um, and I think some of uh, our councillor peers here are help, help with that, which is um, very valuable. Um, and another key area we get involved with we, is in terms of development management reviews and things like planning committee reviews, where we advise you um, or councils on um, how they can improve. We target certain areas and then we come up, we, we do, we, we go on site and we do an analysis of what's happening and how it can improve and come up with a set of recommendations. What we also has, have is website support um, for councils and our DM toolkit is very popular. So you can self-help and self-serve with our DM toolkit to improve your DM service. So um, there are a number of other things we have on the website around good practice and toolkits for improving the service. And of course, we have our planning advisory service bulletin that goes out monthly and that provides lots of nice pithy bits of information, uh, events and updates. Uh, and I think it goes out to over a thousand individuals. So that's something that even you as a councillor could sign up to to keep abreast of what's happening. So next slide, Steve. So what are we learning um, through our work with councils? Um, I suppose these these are the kind of um, five five key areas. Um, and as you'd expect me to say that one of the key areas is it really helps um, to have a local plan in place, it provides more certainty uh, for particularly for you as councillors as well as officers around recommendations and policies and ways forwards and the priorities for your area where the site allocations are. It allows you to get development in the right place and it makes it easier to risk development that is proposed in the wrong places. So that's key. Um, you, you and officers are a team, so it's important that you work together effectively and that uh, you're trained effectively. Um, so that's a key, a key matter for you. Um, it's getting harder. And I think that's illustrated by the number of councils in the danger zone. It's getting harder for councils to make quick and defendable decisions. And I think there are there are a number of um, uh, reasons for that. Um, part of it is around resourcing in planning departments. Part of it is around political change going on um, and the level of challenge that there is in local areas, probably largely against development. 
um, and also the number of things to consider. So it's that spe the, that kind of information and the complexity around and planning's get getting harder. So I think for all of those factors and the change that's going on in terms of legislation as well. So all of those factors are playing into that. Um, it's important to engage with residents, agents and developers as well as part of the process. Residents engaging early and that's something um, that developers should be encouraged to do in your area. Um, and in terms of agents and developer developers, it's important to get to get good outcomes to work better with developers rather than having that adversarial relationship. And all of that works better as well if you have an up to date plan. And finally, the importance of investing in leadership, um, having good leaders and managers in your planning services so you can retain, retain and recruit staff and grow your own. So that is critical. And also to have an efficient service um, so to make sure you've got the right IT systems in place and business processes in, in place to have an efficient service. So they are all the key factors that are coming out of the work we're doing. So um, next slide, Steve, moving on to what's on the horizon in terms of DM. There is There are similarities across the board, probably for all of us um, along the themes. Um, the technical information is becoming more complex, as I've said already. So biodiversity net gain is very technical and requires specialists to look at the information and then tell us as planners and you as councillors whether things are acceptable or not. So we need to make sure that we're responding to that Design has genuinely become a more significant and important factor that is coming through in appeal decisions and the government is supporting the guidance that it's prepared and the design coding and modelling that it's it's um, kind of signal will be coming forward. So that's becoming more important in your decision making, which is a positive. Again, stronger emphasis on designation, so it's important and I guess our role as that PAS is, is becoming more significant in terms of supporting councils and um, the government are, are taking a harder line there. Um, changes in performance criteria I talked about before, extensions of time um, uh, will be, there'll be a, a different uh, view on those. We know that Michael Gove in his speech said that they are used for gaming the system. So he will be announcing soon um, proposals around how to control that. So councils need to be aware of that in terms of achieving the performance standards. Um, good news is that statutory consultees will become will come under straight uh, greater scru scrutiny, if I can say scrutiny. So um, that we don't know quite know the detail of that, but they will be held to account around timeliness on providing advice to local planning authorities. And that is really going to help councils improve their performance. Um, there are also going to be new measures around getting better cost recovery around more complex planning applications. Again, that is um, stuff we're going to hear um, shortly um, in the new, you know, in the in spring, I think, um, is an area. So we're going to hear about that shortly. Uh, moving on to the next slide. OK, I think we've moved. We've jumped. Have we jumped? No, I was expecting last one. OK. All right. The world of DM is wrapped up. The yeah. world Thanks, of DM Liz. is wrapped up. So uh, there's a lot of change and um, it's important to be ready for that change. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name's Richard. Um, I look after the environmental planning part of PAS. Uh, and this slide says an overview and guide to strategy for councils, because I think lots of the other pieces of this, they're about things that you've got to do and you don't have a great deal of choice. And I think what I'm learning about the environment actually is that you do get to make some choices. I'm just going to start my timer because I have a bet with Steve that I'm not going to get through. Are you still with us, Rich? I think Rich has pressed the wrong button. Yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> Bear with us. So, time away to mount. <laughs> uh, 
I'll tell you, what, I shall cover Richards whilst he's uh, whilst he's just uh, whilst he's coming in to join us. So yeah, so what we're going to try to do here is just trying to cover through some of the hot topics of things that are there. Again, some of the kind of structure how we've done this through the other sessions about how we can help. Actually, one of the big learning things that are going on, but kind of what's on the horizon, but also some kind of key questions as well for you to to uh, uh, to, to to kind of to, to 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 maybe take away and have a little think about as well when you're back at the thing. So. Um, uh, we there was a the, the Environment Act uh, uh, 2021 introduced a lot of new things uh, as how we are going to look at the environment slightly different through the planning process, um, uh, of which they are kind of driving factors around kind of how we are thinking about how planning interacts around both uh, nature in itself, but also around things like waste uh, and around water uh, as well across a number of other areas as well uh, it's quite a long term it's quite a long this is quite a long term process steve, steve i'm back well done mate thank you oh. for, for well i was only on the i was only on the long term act so there you go i'll let you carry on if you want richard honestly i don't know what happened i just started talking and my computer just went boof like that like it was <laughs> bored of hearing me uh, so yes i think definitely we have to start with the environment act 2021 introduced all sorts of really big things uh, some of which we do understand. So biodiversity net gain uh, started this week, which you've probably heard about because uh, it's going to bite on all new major planning applications and it will bite later in the year on non-major planning applications. And some of it, I have to say, is quite uh, is still up for grabs. I mean, I think uh, some of my colleagues spend lots of time worrying about what happens on the coast, what happens with erosion, what happens when you have a landfill that's falling into the sea, who's responsible for it, you know, what, what are we supposed to do about it? Uh, so some of it, I think, is still very much an evolving piece. And I think what it does is it plays alongside other commitments that you've made about the environment as a council, whether you've made, you know, a kind of a local statement of biodiversity emergency or an ecological emergency or you've got a carbon reduction target. Uh, and all of this kind of goes into the same melting pot. Next slide, Steve. Um, so I suppose that's the big picture thinking about the environment to draw it in a little bit more closely just to think about the planning bit of this. Uh, again, for the first time, we are as a country embarking on making local nature recovery strategies. There are 48 of them. They follow largely uh, county areas, the larger unitary areas. I think there's a couple of combined authorities that are charged with making them. Uh, it's the first time that we've ever done it. And for me, I think it's a kind of an opening statement of what, what's where and, ha and how good it looks and what we might be able to do to make it to make it better. Um, I think it's really early days to say much about the success of it. Um, I think we're waiting to see, personally, to be frank, I think I'm waiting to see, OK, we can write some of this stuff down, but then what do we do next? Like, can we just not have a strategy that's in the book, but also can we have a strategy that leads to some sort of delivery plan and improvement plan, that kind of thing? Uh, the 10% increase in biodiversity for planning applications that is going to start. And if you're on planning committee, you will start to see them in a few months time in front of you where you'll uh, get to hopefully see a better commitment to preserve and enhance habitats, both on site uh, and locally. There's a new thing called a protected site strategy, which um, again has been designed by Natural England as a way of kind of using the convening power to try to get a number of different organisations to work together to improve some of our most special sites, our kind of triple SIs, our uh, sites with special habitats, special special animals in them, uh, because often it isn't, you know, the, the cause of poor quality isn't simple and isn't single. It's not about exp uh, helping kind of one organisation or one farmer to do something differently. It requires coordination and that's what protected site strategies are supposed to do and of course we're doing all this in the teeth of a real kind of sharpening of the public focus the public mood about water and about rivers more generally whether it's just uh, water availability you know people are talking about the cambridge etc about whether there's actually enough water to make it work water quality or otherwise river quality particularly is uh, is in the news the whole time and obviously depending on the season uh, there's flooding to think about too steve next slide So that's uh, the picture of the environment. How can we help? I think it's fair to say that the environmental planning side of PAS 
is quite new. We've been going for only a couple of years. It's grown from having very, very little to say about the environment to having quite a lot to say about the environment. It's almost half of what we do now. And we work not just with the uh, Department of Living Up Housing and Communities, but with DEFRA and for Natural England. And as organisations like us often end up doing, I mean, our job in some ways is to take various different bits of governments that are talking about similar things, sometimes in quite different ways, and trying to synthesise something out of it that makes sense for local government and makes sense for councils like yours. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that at the moment our offer is mostly officer centric. We focused on understanding the technical side of things and the regulatory side of things. Um, it is a kind of commitment that I've got that in time and hopefully fairly soon, we're going to get around to talking about the politics. We're going to get around to talking about the, the leadership because that's what's really going to, to drive this. And also it's a way of kind of unlocking all of the potential that you've got. I mean, it's a recurring theme in my work that I'm incredibly passionate, switched on people who really want to move this agenda forward and they don't really know how to. And when they kind of, when I sort of talk to them about how they try to engage the wider council and the wider corporate kind of body and the councillors, they don't really know how to. So perhaps one thing that you can do is to work out where all these people are hiding in your council and uh, ask them some questions. Steve, next slide, please. So carrying on, uh, we've got uh, a big um, officer network at the moment because uh, to be fair to everybody, our main focus has been this kind of deadline of this week for the introduction of biodiversity net gain. I'm very keen that it's not seen as something technical and big and scary, but it is a little bit technical and it is a little bit big and a little bit scary. And it was a very hard deadline. So we've been mainly focused about that. Um, you'll notice that the councillor's guide doesn't have an underline on that. I was really hoping to have it ready for today so I could say, here's a thing that we've made just for you and it's brand new. It's probably going to be out next week, but when we share these slides that, that will have a an underline on it and there will be a link about what you what do you need to know particularly when you're sitting on a planning committee about what you can reasonably push developers to do and what you can't reasonably ask um, uh, developers to do there's also a nature toolkit that we're launching in the spring this is a kind of structured approach to take your council through kind of three three chunks of work effectively saying you as a council uh, you probably own land, you probably operate services, and you probably have a really powerful network. Uh, you know, and into parish councils and neighbouring organisations and nature trusts and all the rest of it. Uh, are you sure that you've done all you can? Are there any things that you can do that might be fairly cheap and might be fairly easy for you to do, but will have a, a, a good impact? And what can you do that links back to that thing I was talking before about the local nature recovery strategy? What are your opportunities to do to do things better for nature? Some of you, some unhappy bunch of you will know what I mean when I say nutrient neutrality and the rest of you will be blissfully unaware. It's one of the most horrible problems that we've done, I think, ever in PAS, actually, and that's saying something. So we've been uh, working with those catchments that have had a nutrient neutrality notice because of um, river pollution. There have been a recent round of, of money awarded and we're working with the councils to understand how to how to set up kind of mitigation schemes. And then the last thing, protected site strategies, I mentioned them before. Uh, we're not really waiting to be told what they're going to do and how they're going to work. We're going to try and get, go out there and find a few places and to pilot some and to see whether they actually do the job of helping work, helping people work together. Steve. So I suppose just to pause then for a moment or two of reflection. Um, and again, it, it is all quite new and every, every day, every day is a school day for me uh, at the moment. And I think the first thing or the prime question, if that doesn't sound slightly grand, the main, th the main thing I think uh, I wrestle with most days is whether or not we collectively understand the role or the opportunity for local government in all of this because for every council saying brilliant do you know what i want to be more involved in the management of water quality i've got a real kind of opportunity here to represent the needs of the water and the river users and you know we'll, we're going to get involved there are also you know kind of uh risks and i don't know that we really yet understand what incentives we can find for local government to step up 
and deliver on some of these complicated agendas because yeah there are long-term potential risks and we don't really understand how to incentivize the opportunities i don't think yet but it but personally again i suppose i feel that um it would be remiss not to use the fact that a you own lots of land and b you know people who operate lots of land and you've got both hard and soft power and you've got the community sort of standing behind you and you've got this wonderful kind of convening role to take some of the energy and the heat that comes to you from communities to to do something about this to actually apply pressure on everyone so i suppose i don't i don't really understand the role fully but i'm convinced that local government is going to end up being an important part of the solution of the of making things better here and at the moment it's definitely fair to say that there is a gap between the way government has applied some duties on local government, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but there are some new duties that you've been given, but without really much money to go along with them. So I suppose one of my jobs is to try to find not just opportunities for you to get involved, but opportunities for you to get involved sustainably in the long term without needing to just pour money into it for year after year after year. And I suppose the, the last kind of point on the slide is an interesting one for us as the planning advisory service, because particularly those of you from rural constituencies, you will recognise that all of these things are far bigger, far, far bigger than planning and far bigger than councils even. So quite what role is, that, is, is do we have trying to talk to this much bigger kind of audience? And that's something I think that we haven't quite worked out yet. Steve. So I suppose this is... What do I think? Well, I have good days and bad days, as we all do, but I think uh, more or less most days I'm very happy. And I think actually, obviously, there's more work to be done. There's new things to be done. There's new things to be learning about. But I think it is absolutely fantastic. And almost everyone I work with thinks it's absolutely fantastic that finally we get to think and act about nature and not just from a planning perspective where previously we might have thought about well we have to protect this bit because it's lovely therefore we will act to ensure that nothing happens to it we even have to switch now to be more proactive our model is not just you're not allowed to do anything it's actually do you know what we do want something to happen here and we want it to get better and better and better and we want it to be linked up with the other thing and look there's a corridor forming and let's let's make sure that and it's that kind of um that kind of long term commitment uh, to delivery that I think is going to really kind of bear fruit really quite quickly. And I think one of the other kind of interesting things, and I'm interested that whether this comes across in some of your questions or not, but I think sometimes when you go to uh, the public at large and you talk to them about climate change or carbon reductions or things like that, it's, it's, it's quite a tough sell if you're not talking to the people who are already really keen on it. But I think saying we want to improve nature, we want to improve birds, we want to improve pollinators, we want to improve all these kind of quite relatable things. I think this is quite, you know, we're pushing at an open door here, I think, with, with communities. I think there is, because of DEFRA's involvement, perhaps, there's also a kind of interesting position for councils about how you engage with something which at its heart has a kind of market concept at the middle of it. So when you're sometimes when you're thinking about planning, you your starting point is from a from a gently kind of regulatory perspective. But now I think we're we're seeing places like or organizations like the Environment Bank Bank sort of buy sites, invest in them, create new habitats because they believe they can then sell them on to people who are going to need to have something sort of identifiable as, as mitigation. And we're starting to see some councils and groups of councils starting to set up special purpose vehicles, sort of armed length organisations so that they can trade more freely, they can operate more freely than councils can. I think everyone's going into that with kind of very wary kind of eye, but that's definitely happening and there are two or three of them uh, already. And I think one of the things that uh, is difficult for you, for all of us, is you know when you're starting to think about well okay let's let's lean into this let's let's do some kind of good work here i think it's really easy to kind of go into a little spin slightly because you're thinking about what well, habitats and nature and health and the economy and carbon and public health and tree cover and you know some of the other aspects of the environmental improvement plan it's all kind of linked it all feels quite complicated it's not quite sure what the first step is we all will almost everyone that i talk to accepts 
big, beautiful, bold kind of agenda here, but practically, what, what do you do tomorrow? And I think that's a really kind of interesting, interesting question. And that's, if you like, the question that's at the heart of our nature kind of toolkit about trying to help you understand how ambitious you want to be and actually practically where you can start. Next slide, Steve. So on the horizon, so that sort of brings you up to date. Uh, I think the two things for me on the horizon are um, the environmental improvement plan. So the environmental, the environmental improvement plan is a massive basket of targets uh, that sort of that sort of float around, and they're targets, if you like, for UK PLC. So things like we're going to have so many more kind of acres or protected, we're going to have so many more trees, we're going to have so many more tree coverage. Uh, and there's a kind of, there's a translation job to kind of say, well, look, if that's what's going to happen to UK PLC, how does my patch, how does our council kind of play its part in that? And if it requires us to do something differently or to spend some money or to do that kind of thing, how, how does that stack up for us? Because trees are lovely but they're not free and you have to maintain them and all that kind of stuff and kind of there's a, there's a job for us all i think to unpack the the targets in the eip which are big and long term and try to sort of turn them into things that are understandable to us in in the short term i think the other thing uh, alongside that is general kind of governmental uh, push to speed up the delivery Pretty much of everything, but in particular, uh, how we think about infrastructure and how we think about the infrastructure for energy and for water and for the for the stuff of life, and how that plays uh, in rural places and how that plays in kind of urban places. And I think there is a conversation to be had about all of the impacts, lots of the disruption, if I can call it that, might be felt in rural places for the benefit of urban places. And how do you make that kind of feel fair? How do you make sure everyone feels kind of safely done by? And alongside that, uh, there's something that, um, again, in a year or two's time is going to make your planners kind of funnel their foreheads, which is about simplifying uh, how we think about the environment and turning it less about paperwork and more into a kind of management of outcomes. I think that's the, the approach there. So I think at that point, I'm going to stop because I did a crib sheet of questions, but no one else did. So I think I, unless you tell me I've got two minutes left, Steve, I think at that point, I'm going to say you're thank super you. super quick, stop. Richard, you can have your two minutes. All right, lovely. I will take my two minutes because I think someone told me once that the job of a councillor is to ask devastatingly simple questions again and again and again. So if I were a councillor wanting to find out uh, what was going on in my council and how ready we were on this journey, these are the sort of questions I would be asking. And I would start with the kind of basics. So biodiversity net gain is coming. H have we sorted out how we're going to get ecologically, ecological advice? Have we sorted out the planning committee is properly trained? Do we know what we can and can't do to make biodiversity net gain work for us? Have we even got some uh, opportunities to uh, get our land into biodiversity net gain? Um, then there's green infrastructure standards and dual local contacts. This is more for urban places. So I think for, for me, there is going to be quite a marked difference between big unitary councils, councils with lots of opportunity for betterment of their local environment and tightly bound urban places. And if you're a tightly bound urban place, you probably don't want to waste lots of time thinking about biodiversity in that game. But what you do want to talk about is green infrastructure standards, which is how you introduce nature into urban environments. And partly, one of the other questions that you should be asking is, do we even know whether this matters much to us? Because it does land differently in different sorts of councils. So I think um, you will find officers and there'll be a little team of people in your council who might be frustrated, who might feel they're not being listened to, but they'll want to help you understand how thinking differently about nature can help you deliver a corporate objective. So if you've got a corporate objective about health or about health outcomes or about you know, differential outcomes in different sorts of populations, you know, nature can do really fantastic work when you're thinking about that kind of stuff. But you do need to make sure that it gets kind of airtime amongst all of the other priorities. Everyone wants to talk about budget. No one really wants to talk about nature. And sometimes uh, your job as councillors will really help understand the community perspective and to get buy-in because 
you know, I might bounce around and be all enthusiastic about, you know, nature solutions. Some people might go, actually, do you know what? I don't want that there because that's where I park my car or that's where I do my thing or that's where am I ever. And I think there is that that job for, for councillors in, in making sure that everyone feels uh, they get a say. Uh, yeah, and I suppose the last point on that slide is, do do staff know, like you you might personally have a view on how important this nature stuff is and perhaps some of your colleagues do as well but is it explicit do you keep saying it do people feel supported if they want to kind of spend some time spend some spend some energy on this and then i've got the very last slide yeah so this is how you recognize whether you've already started so have you organized yourself differently so this agenda the environmental agenda doesn't usually break down neatly into divisional silos councils love putting themselves in silos and when you want to talk about talk about health and the environment and the economy and whatever you're suddenly having to work right across silos so have you organized differently do you have a champion is it a recognized someone's portfolio and have you actually done anything yet? Like I, I work with some brilliant people and I, I love them very much. But even they, when you get them kind of quietly, like they, they, they say, yeah, we do a lot of talking. We haven't really got down to the doing yet. So I think you can be you can afford to be quite. Yeah, OK, you meet every month and you have this chat. But actually, what are we actually doing? That's a, re that's a really, really good question. Um, I am not going to talk about that last bit. There are some opportunities, but I think if I rush through them, I won't do them justice. So I'm going to say thank you very much, Steve. OK, thank you, Richard. Uh, and last but no means least, I just, uh, Gareth, uh, uh, Gareth, one of my colleagues, and uh, uh, David Brackenbury, who's one of our peers, just going to give you a kind of a bit of a talk through the peer role. We figured it's such a great opportunity with such a great number of councillors in the room to kind of uh, just to, to promote the peer role, actually, because it's really important with how, the, how we work. Uh, Gareth, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I hope you don't mind if we can just test your patience a little bit before we go to your questions. It, it is great to see so many people on the call, so many elected members involved and interested in in planning to come along this evening. And so it's an opportunity for us to talk really about the importance of your role as elected members and how we rely on that to do some of our work, really. So, I mean, really quickly, you know, you can see the breadth of ground we've covered this evening. It is big. Sometimes it's a little bit humbling. Each of these different topics we've been talking about have specialists and professionals who are experts in them, but they're not the only people who make change happen in local councils, as you well, will know as elected members. Yeah, and, and, oh, I think someone's got the microphone on. Um, OK, but, but so, so so as 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 kind of as as a planning advisory service, we rely on local elected members working with us as planning peers or elected member peers to help us deliver some of our work in local authorities and ask those really important questions that Richard started to talk about. You know, well, what does all this mean for my local authority? How do you organise yourself better? What do your local community think about this and how are you going to bring them on board? And it, a lot of our work does require this politician to politician conversation and discussion, not just officers talking about the technicalities. So to do this, we, we rely on people who have experience working in planning portfolio holder roles or experienced planning committee members to come forward and work with us as member peers and bring some of that political perspective when we're working with local authorities. So we need that advice kind of of member peers as because elected members understand the current political challenges faced by councils and actually bring credibility to our work as well when we're working in local authorities because you can say things and do things as elected members that, that we as officers can't. As it says on the slide there, you know, that there's you know a, a range of things. It's that political perspective, it's, be, it's about being a critical friend, helping your colleagues in other local authorities by asking them difficult questions and helping them to learn the learn where they can improve and and kind of look at opportunities for that learning and improvement there are lots of ways that you can do that as a peer um some of them we've mentioned this evening so we do something called a, a planning peer challenges where we bring a team of elected members and officers into 
a local authority to look at their planning service across the hall and how it can be improved. As Liz said, we do a lot of planning committee reviews and planning committee training. That's not just done by an officer. We ask a member peer to come along to help us deliver that kind of exercise as well. And sometimes when we've done these reviews or we've done these peer challenges, follow up work involves things like individual mentoring and support for elected members in other local authorities to help them kind of take take on board and go up to speed and deliver the type of actions that, that, that have been recommended in the rev, in the reviews that we've done. So it is an important role, but I wonder if I could just ask Councillor David Brackenbury, who is one of our peers, just to talk about how it feels from his perspective and perhaps importantly, David, why you do it as well, because I think there's, there's a lot that you get out of it as well too. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Well, um, well good, good evening, everybody. And um, you know it's nice to it's nice to see so many people on the call, and it's uh, nice to have the opportunity um, to actually blow the trumpet for the planning advisory service and the peer review um, structure, because it really does seem to make a difference. And to give a bit of background, um, I uh, was a district councillor on East Northamptonshire District Council for many years. Um, I was the chair of planning policy. In, in that council, but we already worked with three other neighbouring authorities in what is now North Northamptonshire um, to produce our own joint core strategy, um, which we, which was adopted in 2016. Um, subsequently, North Northamptonshire became a unitary, uh, North Northamptonshire and West Northamptonshire covers the ceremonial county. Um, it became a unitary in May 2021, and I was briefly the chair of strategic planning. Um, I think I did two meetings and then I was asked to step up to the executive for as the um, um, portfolio holder for growth and regeneration, which covers um, growth and regeneration, many other things and planning in all its charming iterations. Um, I was um, it was suggested that I applied to become a member peer um and i really i i think this is a great idea because it enables it enables us to actually pick up in, interesting information and interesting um perspectives from other authorities so i did the i did the um the sort of form filling and accreditation process was accepted as a member peer and um i've now done oh let me see three or four um, planning committee training sessions, and with with Gareth, um, we we jointly did the and, and some other friends. We jointly did the um, Thurrock peer review a few months ago. Um, I got a lot out of that. Um, you know, Thurrock is obviously a council which has got a number of difficulties, a lot of which are corporate, not necessarily planning, but it affects everything, and actually getting into another authority and getting under the skin of it a little bit it really is useful because there's nothing any authority does that isn't that cannot be of interest um to everybody you know everybody has um something they that lessons to teach and you do pick up such a lot um it's really valuable from your own personal development um, to go in as a member peer to interact with the, the, the officers and friends on the planning advisory service because they know what they're doing very much and to have, try to help um, the authorities who have asked for the training or asked for the peer reviews you know we we, we don't want to go in there as um, the sort of government inspectors and all of that it's not the idea at all the idea is to go in and to be, as the slide said a moment ago, to be critical friends, to try to see what they're doing right and praise what they're doing right, to try to see perhaps areas where they need to improve and to work with the authority and with their consent and, you know, with their buy-in to improve the planning service of whichever authority you're at to make it the best it can be. Um, it is 
hard work, it, it, no, no question about it, but it's very, very rewarding. Um, and it, as Gareth said in his introduction, it's also very valuable from a member point of view, because Gareth and all his friends and Stephen, you know, they're the experts. All the planning officers, they are the experts. But, but while we are not experts in planning ourselves, or we shouldn't, you know, in development management and looking at this application, that application, you have to take officer advice. We have, we are all as councillors. We're democratically elected, and we have, we have accountability to the people who put us in in office. And because of that, we have perhaps a better communicative link with the residents of whichever authority you serve in. And it provides a, a different perspective from the professional planning officer and indeed the professional planning, you know, the, the professional planning policy world, which rather, rather, um, you know, rather indicates what we can and what we can't do. Um, so working as as critical friend but i mean friend with the authorities that you um are working working alongside is very rewarding but and it's good for the authority because they get that outside perspective they get this team um for a for a simple review um you know for a committee training or something it might be one officer and one member but it usually is one officer or more than one officer and what and a member um for the for the grant for the group for the major planning peer reviews um there will be a number of officers and there would normally be a member from the controlling group and a, and a member from the opposition group but of course in terms of planning as we all know Planning is apolitical. Um, you know, you leave your party allegiance at the door of a planning committee. And it, you know, doing the thorough review is terrific because we had three excellent officers. Um, Gareth was one, so I'll, I'll allow his blushes. And we also had um, a opposition member peer, um, lovely guy, um, Labour, Labour member from Salford. And him being Labour, me being Conservative, didn't matter a damn. We we got on like a house on fire, and we all all five of us worked really hard together to give the best review of, of a challenging um, situation and to give that best perspective as possible. So, in conclusion, I'm sorry I've rambled on a little bit, but in conclusion, um, if anybody on this call is interested. Um, in becoming a member peer, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's very rewarding. Um, it's rewarding for you. It's rewarding for your authority. It's a good opportunity to fly the flag for your authority. And it's really valuable for the um, authorities uh, that we seek to serve. So I uh, can't recommend it highly enough, ladies and gentlemen. And there are still 67 people who've survived that, um, that tirade on, and are still on the call. Yeah. Thank you, David. I mean, I, I, you know, the way that we work with our member peers is it's, it's really vital. I mean, members have a very important role to play in planning. Officers don't do this on their own. They do this with members. So actually the input that members have in our work is really vital and obviously there's lots of new things that are coming up and there's lots of new things the things that you've just heard now and helping uh, councillors to make decisions is what officers are really there to do and what the member peers do is really kind of help to invigorate that that knowledge so uh, i'm really pleased to see that angela has put up the link for anybody who is interested in becoming a, a councillor peer uh, to contact the conservative uh, group uh, to go so yeah thank you david i really appreciate you giving us your time today I, I know it's election day today in your in your in your area so hopefully your feet are well rested well well i've, I've had a i've had a, an hour off um listening to this very interesting presentation so when 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 this breaks up i shall go back to see what last minute knocking up and uh, the sunny sunny wellingborough by election so Brilliant. watch thank your you, newspapers david. tomorrow that's great so i'm gonna we're gonna go into some